Welcome to the award-winning Consumer Finance Monitor podcast, where we explore important new developments in the world of consumer financial services and what they mean for your business, your customers, and the industry. This is a weekly show that is brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services Group at the Ballard Spar Law Firm. I'm your host, Alan Kaplinsky the former practice group leader for 25 years and now senior counsel of the Consumer Financial Services Group at Ballard Spar. And I'll be moderating today's program. For those of you who want more information, don't forget about our blog, consumerfinancemonitor.com. We launched our blog program on July 21, 2011. Uh, That's the day that the CFPB got stood up. And we uh, actually launched our blog on the very same day that that uh, occurred. Um, We also uh, regularly host webinars on subjects of interest to those in the industry. So to subscribe to our blog or to get on the list for our webinars, please visit us at ballardspar.com. And if you like our podcast, please let us know about it. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, or whatever platform you may use to access your podcast. Also, please let us know if you have ideas for other topics that we should consider covering or speakers that we should consider as guests on our show. So, Uh, Let me, first of all, um, introduce the topic that we're going to talk about today, and then uh, I'm going to introduce our very special guest. So the topic that we're going to talk about is whether or not there should be a private cause of action under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act has been on the books for decades, and it proscribes unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Uh, It's enforced exclusively by the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, There is no private right of action. Many of the states have what are called mini FTC laws that are patterned after Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act in that they also uh, proscribe unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Even a few of them go a little bit beyond that and uh, proscribe abusive acts and practices, similar to the authority uh, in the Consumer Financial Protection Act that's given to the CFPB. The person who our guest, uh, who I'm about to introduce, has written a very, very interesting and provocative uh, law review article uh, advocating for a private right of action. It's called The Private Attorney General in a Time of Hyperpolarized Politics. Uh, and it's in... Um, uh, volume 65 of the Arizona Law Review, uh, beginning at page 337. So now let me uh, in- introduce our uh, special guest today. Uh, and our guest is Miriam Gillis. Uh, she is a graduate of Harvard Radcliffe College, Yale Law School. She was a litigation associate at Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, before joining the faculty at the Benjamin N. Cardoza School of Law in 2000, where she holds the Paul R. Vercuile Research Chair. I probably should tell me I got that wrong in a minute. Uh, She specializes in class actions and aggregate litigation, has written extensively on forced arbitration clauses, a subject which Uh, all of our listeners know is near and dear to my heart. She's testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee on multiple occasions 
the House Judiciary Committee also on multiple occasions to discuss the impact of forced arbitration and class action bans. And she's testified also before numerous state legislatures uh, regarding uh, the same subject. Her articles have appeared in practically all the nation's top law reviews, including Berkeley, Chicago, Columbia, Michigan, Penn, Texas, and Yale. And her work has been cited uh, numerous times in uh, judicial decisions. She's actually the fifth most cited civil procedure scholar in the country and the editor of a very influential case book in the field dealing with civil procedure. I could go on and on and on, Miriam. You have got so many very impressive credentials, but I think I'll stop there because I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about your interesting article. So, First of all, a very warm welcome to our show. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I'm impressed just listening to it. I can't believe that's really my life. Um, uh, and thank you for having me uh, on the podcast. Long time listener, first time <laughs> guest. <laughs> first time guest, yeah, yeah. Uh, although I think we've actually, I think of one of the hearings that uh uh, was held on arbitration. I think you may have been on the same panel with me, at least that, that's a vague recollection I have. In any event, and, and I think it was before a, a panel that was a little more receptive to what you were arguing than what I was arguing. But let's turn to the subject du jour. Uh, and that is uh, your, your law review article and the extensive research you've done on the subject. Your research shows that the origins of federal consumer protection law are inextricably linked to the rise of antitrust enforcement. Why was that? So this was an interesting bit of research for me um, because I hadn't really understood how interconnected these two concepts were. Because obviously for us sitting here today in 2023, we think about, uh, and in your law firm, for example, you've got a you know an antitrust group or a, competi- a competition group, and you've got a consumer group, and those things are are separate, and we really do think of them as separate uh, entities. But back at the turn of the last century, they were quite intertwined, and I think there are a few reasons for this. Um, first of all, you know the very basic hydraulic pressure of anti-competitive conduct. Rise, having the the tendency to raise consumer prices. So the idea is if you can regulate the anti-competitive conduct, you can protect both consumers and competitors. So that that's sort of the easy answer. But I think there are a couple of more interesting ones, or I, I certainly found them interesting. Um, you know, my research showed that the very idea of consumers, which we take for granted today, hadn't really actually been developed um, at the turn of the last century. Um, Historians have shown that it's the period right after World War II that marks the beginning of a kind of immense eruption of consumption, and consumption and consumerism, of course, are pretty linked. Um, So by the time, uh, you know, the great Justice Trainer of the California Supreme Court writes his concurring opinion in Escola versus Coca-Cola, all your listeners know that case, um, And he explains to us that handicrafts have been replaced by mass production, that consumers no longer um, understand even where their products are coming from, right? In 1944, that's striking a nerve, but I don't think it would have struck a nerve even 10 or 20 years earlier. Um, And finally, I think this is uh, an important bit for the paper, uh, for the argument I make in the paper. Um, Before 1900, I think citizens did not really see themselves as being protected by the federal government. State and local government is what protected our health, our welfare, and to the extent there was anything even resembling consumer protection, it was protected by the states. But of course, um, this is the era, right? The era of U.S. steel, U.S. sugar, all these big conglomerates, these industries that are, are becoming nationwide, some of them actually even bigger than that. And it, it's impossible for states to really regulate these industries in a way or, or to protect consumers from uh, from misconduct by these massive industries. And so 
anti-competitive justifications sort of start to uh, start to get braided together with uh, with consumer protection. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know whether uh, you'd agree with this or not, but I think in a, in a sense, things have come full circle, Miriam, in that today and really, uh, I would say, uh, ever, ever since uh, Lena Khan has uh, been in charge, the chairwoman of the FTC, uh, and Roe Chopra, who was a member of the FTC and now director of the CFPB. It's just about everything I read coming out of those agencies focuses on competition or anti-competitive behavior or makes the point that um, uh, if a competitor violates the uh, consumer protection law as opposed to an antitrust law, uh, that creates anti, that's anti-competitive behavior because it's hurting the rest of the industry. And so, um, actually I did a podcast a little bit earlier this year, uh, with a couple of colleagues at my firm who are antitrust lawyers. One of them is, uh, uh, a very prominent antitrust lawyer by the name of Ed Rogers. Uh, and, he came to me because he said we, he is seeing a just an increase in antitrust litigation against banks and consumer financial services providers. And he thought it would be an interesting topic. And then uh, coming up, I'm going to be doing a uh, actually a webinar very soon talking about the so-called dark patterns. Uh, that um, have been talked about a lot by the FTC and the CFPB. And part of that uh, discussion uh, also has a connection to anti-competitive behavior and antitrust. So I think in a funny kind of way, uh, it, it comes full circle. Do you agree with that? I do actually, and it's interesting, you know. And I, I wish I wish I talked to you before um, I finalized this paper because that would have been a great kind of conclusion to sort of talk about how we're back to uh, a moment of really seeing antitrust and uh, and consumer protection as being one in the same after a number of years of, you know, the trust busting and, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and stuff that didn't feel like it was exactly uh, oriented towards consumer protection, which is part of my story, right? Because part of the story here is that the FTC, once it it, it is uh, it becomes a thing, um, once it's authorized by the FTCA, the FTC really focuses so much of its attention and and uh, resources on competitors, right? On true antitrust suits, not on consumer protection. It doesn't really see that as part of its bailiwick uh, for for a long, long time, if ever. And you know, and I think one of the interesting um, bits of history that maybe your your listeners don't don't know, I didn't know, is that the FTC was really uh, critical in getting states to enact these mini FTC acts that you're talking about, right? They they floated a model act that was the sort of the gold standard uh, for a lot of states because they, they really didn't want to be in the business of consumer protection. They thought that states and localities would do a better job because they were just closer to the action. And I think now we're sort of seeing the FTC say, no, 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 like that's part of a, that's part of our portfolio, right? Lena Khan sees what she's doing is not just being a trust buster, but having the the positive effects of uh, of that trust busting sort of trickle down to consumers. And you know, you and I could debate whether that's good or bad, but certainly I think as a descriptive matter, um, I agree. Yeah, and even the CFPB. Uh, who um, you have to look very, very carefully to find any mention of anti-competitive behavior in the Consumer Financial Protection Act. But certainly Rohit Chopra views it as part of uh, his um, authority uh, to uh, to look into that and to be concerned about it. He mentions it 
uh, literally all the time. He does. And his basis, at least the cases that I'm thinking about or the areas I'm thinking about, when when he talks about payday lending, right, I think there's good reason uh, to think that there are some uh, anti-competitive effects that are enabling this industry to charge usurious rates, to engage in misconduct without real repercussions, right? There's there, There's been a lot of consolidation. There's just a handful of companies that own all of the payday lenders, and they basically operate uh, very similarly across uh, across the country. So I do think that, you know, it's not just that these regulators, um, who I know you're not big fans of, but but it's not just that these regulators are taking on antitrust as a kind of a, a mantra. It's the fact that co- company, there has been greater consolidation in lots of areas that have real impact on consumers' you know, the products they buy, the prices they they pay, uh, their experiences as consumers in the marketplace. So there's just been a lot of consolidation. Yep. Yep. So um, you write in your article, uh, Miriam, that policymakers in the early 20th century generally understood that placing all consumer protection authority in the hands of government actors, whether they be state or federal, was unwise. Why has that thinking changed so radically over the past century? Wow. So one could write a book about this and probably somebody has, right? I mean, you know, uh, you and I have lived through just this like sliver of time in which the plaintiff's bar has become, um, the plaintiff's class action bar has become such a potent force. Um, But but, but let me, let me try to put this in some historical context because the paper does try to do a sort of historical look at this. So just as the idea of a consumer didn't really develop until post-World War II, the same with um, private antitrust litigation doesn't really get going until right after World War II. Um, Private enforcement of antitrust suits, we see those increase. There are lots of great um, charts out there that can show you the rise of these cases, especially follow-on suits that piggybacked off government investigations or government enforcement actions. We see a huge increase. And the lawyers that are bringing these cases, uh, most notably that major price-fixing case in the electrical manufacturing space that led to the passage of the MDL statute, um, the lawyers bringing those cases start, you know, to really develop an identity, a network, right? They, they are, they're doing some of the work that we see lawyers on the plaintiff side do today, having these collaborative networks to bring complex litigation. Um, so that, coupled with the adoption of the class action rule, uh, the modern class action rule in 1966, really gives lawyers an incredible amount of power to bring antitrust suits, you know, co- you know, along with those trouble damages that, that are that, that's the pot at the end of the rainbow, there's a great financial incentive to do this. I think that, you know, if the government could, if Congress um, could have seen what the private bar would become when it enacted the FTC Act, I wonder whether they, they might not have added a private right of action, right? I think at the time, the idea was that public enforcement would do, uh, even the threat of public enforcement would deter anti-competitive conduct, much less full-on enforcement actions. Um, but I think, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I think the private bar has in many ways been a very successful font of enforcement authority over the past century. Um, and so so the changes, you know, it's an impossible question to answer because the changes are are so immense and there's so many of them. Uh, but but I do think the times have, have truly changed. Yeah. Although, um, you know, I uh, don't want to, uh, we could get into a debate talking about the efficacy of class action litigation and uh, how effective that has been because, uh, you know, the even I know it's in the arbitration context, but even the study that the, the CFPB did showed how uh, little uh, the actual payout is to um, consumers that are part of class actions that end up settling uh, that, you know, something like thirty two dollars and change. I think you know this about me because I think we've talked about it. I don't think that the the way the best way to determine the success of the class action device is to look at how much money gets to consumers. I think the class action device is a very 
expensive way of getting dollars into the hands, especially in small value cases, of getting money into the hands of consumers. The better question, and the one that perhaps is impossible to answer because it would require counterfactual understanding, is how has the threat of class action liability deterred companies from engaging in conduct that they would have otherwise engaged in? And I don't know the answer to that, but I think I trust that there are probably lots of things that companies would do if they didn't think that there were plaintiff's lawyers who might catch them out doing it. And I don't think they're as worried about government regulators because I think there is a sense in which, uh, well, for lots of reasons, reasons we probably don't have time to go into, but I don't think government regulation uh, has... It's, it's powerful, and I don't want to take that away from the government, but I think that it's the, the one-two punch that has had the greatest deterrent effect. Well, the only thing I can tell you, uh, Miriam, uh, that's not uh, at least the sense that I get from talking to my clients. They, they don't talk very much about uh, plaintiffs, class action lawyers, and, uh, and class actions that are being filed. Yeah, they... They're aware of it and it's a concern, but the big, you know, enchilada here or the big fear that they have is the CFPB, uh, particularly those that are supervised by the CFPB. Uh, now, because of political changes, obviously, during the Trump era, that became less of a, a worry or a concern. Uh, but even then, the, the, you know, there was supervision was still going on. And uh, Peggy Tuig, who I think is a very uh, responsible and very neutral kind of government regulator, uh, who was the head of supervision policy at the CFPB, both under Richard Cordray and under uh, Kathy Kraninger, they conducted business as usual. Uh, I mean, I've had long discussions uh, uh, with Peggy about that. Nothing really changed in her world. Uh, and in the enforcement area, uh, they, there was a lot of enforcement activity. Even, I mean, the data shows, it surprised me, that there was more enforcement going on then than there is under Rohit Chopra. But, but I agree with you. I'll concede to you. Uh, there wasn't that great, you know, uh, fear that existed when Cordray was at the helm and today with Roe Chopra at the helm. Uh, our clients are scared to death about the CFPB. When I get, whenever I give them uh, advice on how to comply with, you know, they have a new product in mind and the hoops they need to jump through and how they have to comply with the Truth and Lending Act and Equal Credit Opportunity Act, that when I'm done, they say to me, what do you think the CFPB is going to think about it? Um, and my answer is that's exactly what you should be concerned about, because if something doesn't look right or if it's a little controversial, a little bit, you know, edgy, uh, and that maybe there are consumer protection issues or maybe there are dark patterns hovering over, uh, you know, that could affect that product. Uh, that's exactly what to be worried about. Uh, believe me, if, if Rohi Chopra doesn't like it, uh, he will somehow shoehorn it into UDAP, unfair, deceptive, or abusive. I know we got off on this tangent. Well, maybe what you just said is a great way of getting back because you just uh, implied that Chopra might, you know, because he doesn't, if he doesn't like something, he might just decide to put it into a box where he can have regulatory power. So to, and to go back to answering your actual question, this was exactly the concern, right, that at least some people had uh, about how to engage in fair um, legitimate regulation of business uh, at the turn of the last century. If you if you give power to a politico, how are you going to sort of justify it when they intervene, which in, in ways that could be viewed as political in 
economic markets, right? So you have to find a way to not put all your regulatory eggs in the government's basket because it doesn't look good, right? The optics are bad there. Okay, let, let's uh, let's move on uh, because we still have a lot to cover in a short period of time. To the debates that took place in 2012 and 14 over the enactment of the FTC Act have, have any parallels to the current era? Yeah, but it wasn't 2000. It was 19, 1912 to 1914. That was another thing that was just fascinating in doing this research. Um, so first, Congress at the turn of the last century was divided over the right model for regulatory authority. And we can see this because they just enact uh, like three or four major uh, regulatory statutes that empower commissions to engage in quote unquote enforcement, right? So the first one uh, is the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887, which is the nation's first independent regulatory agency charged with controlling railroad rates and very successful at doing so, right? That was a very successful commission. And then we get the Industrial Commission in 1898. Um, Finally, with Teddy Roosevelt, we get the Bureau of Corporations, These are multi-member commissions, um, so they should look a whole lot like uh, what your listeners are used to, right? The the FTC, for example, is a multi-member commission. We have lots of commission models in our current regulatory landscape. Um, So we know that that becomes a preferred approach. But here's the thing. I think the, the commission model really obfuscates exactly what authority you want to grant said commission, Um, So, for example, the Bureau of Corporations was only given the authority to study the problems facing the U.S. economy, study and report, right? Um, And I think we still have a little bit of that concern. Uh, You know, you and I were talking earlier before the podcast about the CFPB and the legislative history there. You know, there's a lot of lot of debate over the CFPB and what powers to grant it, right, to grant this newborn agency um, and how it should look, right, which is something, of course, the Supreme Court's going to decide next term. How is it going to look? How much power should it have? What form should that power take? To whom is it accountable, right? We see in the CFPB a real effort to make that agency uh, completely uh, immune to political pressure. But of course, no agency can be perfectly immune from political pressure. Um, and so, the, you know, some of the same debates that we can see in the 73rd and 74th Congress, we see again in our current Congresses and, and before the current court. I also see a pretty direct line um, between, uh, you know, the 75th Congress, which enacted the FTC Act, um, with their debates over the scope of the of the FTC's authority and the, the case the Supreme Court decided a few years ago, the AMG versus uh, FTC case, right, where the court uh, limited the FTC's ability to seek monetary relief under Section 13. Um, this was a an issue that was actually debated um, in the enactment of the statute. So, so we sort of see unresolved questions in the legislative history getting resolved, but like a century plus later, right? And still we're sort of struggling with some of those same issues. Yeah. Um, your, your research also indicates that there were some members of Congress who may actually have believed that they were voting for a Federal Trade Commission Act that included a private right of action. What what is your um, evidence of that? Right. So this is the actual reason I wrote this piece, uh, because uh, an early bit of research convinced me. And and so let me tell you what I saw. Um, First, there's a lot of evidence that President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, who, along with Brandeis, who was his consigliere, you know, they stumped for this statute. They went to cap- the Capitol and they they talked to legislators and said, we must enact something like this. Um, they Wilson was incredibly worried that commissioners might be uh, might easily succumb to the interests of big business. Right. He thought they could be bought off. So he believed from the start that the FTC Act should include a private right of action. He made that clear, you know, so you you can now you can read his diaries now. Wilson made that clear in every conversation he could. Right. That there should be a private right of action. And some members of Congress surely agreed with the president. Um, We can see this because there are debates over exactly this question. Right. What you know, whether there should be a private right of action, what form it should take. 
some members of Congress, so some, some of my other evidence is more of the implicit sort. So, for example, Senator Moses Clapp of Missouri, he was a big proponent of the FTC Act, a big supporter of the bill. He sponsored an amendment uh, that would have authorized a treble damage cause of action for anyone injured by reason of unfair unfair competition. He was joined by a bunch of other senators. Um, and look, I don't think you try to you propose a trouble damages uh, provision if you don't think there's already a damages provision, right? If you don't think there's already a basis upon which to, to seek damages. I'm not saying that the evidence is clear cut. Right. You know, I think, you you know, the best the best argument against me is, OK, Gillis, then why didn't they do it? Right. Why weren't they explicit about it? Um, you know, I think that lots of people in Congress may have believed that just by making unfair competition illegal and not granting the FTC exclusive jurisdiction, right, not granting the FTC exclusive jurisdiction to police these violations, they were automatically creating a private cause of action uh, for damages. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not the great, I wish I had a smoking gun and I could just say, Alan, I found it. Um, you know, you know, then they could make a movie about this, right? That would be very exciting. Um, but I think it's all the evidence if you just connect the dots and look at it logically. So uh, let, let me just clarify something. Uh, with you or ask a question for you to clarify something. And that is in the original act was the, was did section five only deal with unfair methods of competition or did it also deal with unfair and deceptive acts and practices? The former, only the former. It was narrower. Yeah. When did they add to the statute unfair and deceptive acts and practices? The Wheeler-Lee Amendments in 1938. Uh, okay. And at that time, was there, did your research so that they once again considered whether to add a private right of action? No. And again, that's that's great evidence against me, though I will say I've read the legislative record on the Wheeler-Lee Amendments. Um, there's just about two years of debate over the, this amendment to the FTC. And Congress at this point is trying to fix a lot of little problems in the statute that have come up in uh, in in court decisions, and they're not very focused on this private right of action. I, I submit this: if we had seen by 1938, right? So we're you know 20 years later. If we had seen lots of private, lots of consumers seeking to use Section Five and being rebuffed by the courts, I think the issue might have been ripe for that Congress. But we weren't seeing that. What we saw were businesses, right, competitors trying to use the FTC Act and arguing that they had a private right of action under Section 5. And courts saying, that's what the antitrust laws are for. Go over there and get your private right of action. There's no private right of action here. So we didn't, you know, and this has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, consumers weren't litigating cases in the 1930s, right? I mean, it's just, it really wasn't um, what, it, you know, that, that body of law wasn't developed. People, again, were just starting to think of themselves as consumers. When did the class action rules, rule, uh, Rule 23, when did that get created? Do you 1966, 1966, yeah. So yeah. There, there was no such thing as class action litigation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was an earlier version in the 30s, but it was not useful to the average consumer. And look, arguably, even in the 1960s, it took a long time, right, for the development of a plaintiff spar with enough sort of um, self-funding to be able to, to uh, absorb the cost of a class action. Yeah. Now, what about... The, the so-called implied uh, private right of action. Uh, it had, that had not been litigated at that point. I mean, I know eventually there were cases, I don't know if they uh, involved the FTC Act, but I think in the securities law, I sort of remember uh, a, a case. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I, Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I see. I see a ton of litigation um, brought again by competitors, not by consumers, in the '40s and '50s, um, arguing that there's an implied private right of action under the FTC Act, and all getting rebuffed. All right. So if you know, if you look at the test, and it's just too, it's too complicated to go into now, but the, you know, courts imply, courts use a test to determine whether there's an implied uh, private right of action. And here, there was no case that met the test. And furthermore, and once again, competitors had another place to go, and that's the Sherman Act. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's talk about uh, the problems 
that what you think would be solved by amending the FTC Act to add a private right of action. Well, I guess maybe even before we get to that, uh, as you in your article, you actually say it, it would be actually a very simple amendment to the statute. It wouldn't take a lot of words to add to create that. T- tell us, if you would, what would actually have to be done. And I do think it'll be fairly straightforward. Um, and I think we could pattern it after private rights of action that are granted in lots of other federal statutes, right? From, you know, uh, Title Seven to TILA, I mean, you know, pick your, pick your poison. There's a lot of different ways to, uh, to add that language. I don't think it requires much language, but that ignores the fact that it would take tremendous amounts of political will. Um, and, and, and probably, greater shared sense that it would be a positive thing to do at this point. And I'm not sure that we're there. Does your proposal authorize actual damages as well as statutory penalties or punitive damages? What, what, uh, what would it do? Yeah. So I haven't, I, I don't go that far in this paper. Um, I think a, a lot of that, uh, a lot of those details, which, you know, to call them details, it's not to diminish how significant those questions are, right? I mean, remedies are everything in this sort of uh, business, but, uh, you know, I, I think that that's, um, that's something that is up for discussion and debate. I could imagine, uh, look, I think an actual damages provision would be great. I'm not sure we need more. Um, but, but again, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot more to tease out here, um, about how we would foresee this private right of action being used, what limitations we want to place on it. Um, you know, right now, for example, the FTC before brings a, an enforcement action has to show that the action is in the public, the public interest. Um, would we require the same of a consumer? Uh, right? You know, so there's a lot of questions. You know, I can add some language to statute. Anybody can, yeah. but you know, the the repercussions of that throughout the entire the statutory framework. Actually, I think you were wise not to go down that rabbit hole uh, because uh, that I think would have made it. Um, it makes it more controversial. Uh, you know, when they uh, enacted the Truth in Lending Act. Uh, and then they did it in several other cons- federal consumer protection laws. They put a cap on class action liability uh, because there was a concern about um, companies being saddled with draconian penalties. And, of course, there are statutory penalties also uh, in the um, Truth in Lending Act and in some other federal consumer protection laws. And... Uh, that, um, I think, um, you know, that scares a lot of people. So I think, uh, you were wise leaving that issue off the table, Miriam. But, uh, you were going to get to, uh, the problems that it would solve. Some of these you've alluded to already, but, uh, why why don't you summarize, uh, what, what does would truly accomplish? Well, I mean, maybe the way to answer that best is to tell you what I worry about. What I worry about is, um, as you observed earlier, there, you know, nearly every state has a mini FTC Act, right? A, a, or a state UDAP statute that does a lot of, that fills the enforcement gap that we think might have been left in the wake of the enactment of the FTC Act. Um, and again, the FTC was very much a proponent of that movement. And those, those statutes, Love them or hate them, Alan, right? They, they, they've been used a lot, right? Consumers use them and they, you know, they, they've made some changes in the way the products of all sorts are marketed and sold. Uh, but I worry that we're starting to see, um, some rollback on some of these statutes, um, because, you know, when you can't get Congress to act, you know, I think that what uh, business interests have learned, what the Chamber of Commerce and and the business lobby has learned is you take the fight to the states. And they've been pretty successful at taking the fight to the states. Um, and I talk about this quite a bit in my paper uh, about uh, sort of a concerted, organized effort uh, by the business lobby to amend and weaken state UDAPs. And they've really achieved some pretty significant success. I talk about examples like Arkansas and Mississippi. Um, and who knows where else uh, the, these battles will be fought in the future. But as, leg- as state legislatures lurch to the right, 
I think we have to be concerned about them taking the law with them and sort of uh, emptying out this tr- this this reserve of pretty good consumer law uh, in the hopes of attracting uh, business interests to the state. So I- I'm worried about that. I'm worried, as anybody should be, right, that, you know, if, if what we thought was going to fill the enforcement gap has now left the building, w- what happens to consumers, right? If there's really no, if you're in Mississippi, and you're a consumer, you don't really have a very an operable uh, UDAP statute, and the FTC doesn't have your back. Where do you go, right? Um, so, so that's that's another kind of um, origin story for the paper. Let me ask you a, a very practical question. I know um, a, a lot of what's in your article isn't necessary. You're not necessarily saying that you today you'd be able to get Congress to get this thing through. Um, uh, this Congress uh, can hardly agree on uh, what time of day it is. Uh, and can you imagine introducing a bill like this? Uh, I mean, it just never gets through. What is your, I mean, I take it your hope is eventually get to get this thing passed, but it would have to be a um, Democratic-controlled Senate uh, by a significant amount. You know, you probably need to get the minimum of 60 votes to avoid the filibuster and you need control of the House and you need a Democratic president. Um, And uh, that doesn't look like it's in the cards right now. No, it certainly doesn't. We'd have to go back to early Obama, um, which, you know, if I could roll back to that, I I, I would um, uh, in a heartbeat. Um, Although it would mean that I'd have to then relive the last number of years. So maybe I wouldn't after all. (laughs) Um, no, I think it will be hard. You know, um, so Senator Whitehouse, Democrat of uh, from Rhode Island, um, he and his staff were working uh, during COVID on a kind of an omnibus bill that would deal with all sorts. It was, you know, it was like it, it was a Democrat's a progressive proceduralist wish list, um, passing the FAIR Act, um, working on qualified immunity legislation. And this was on his list. Um, So I think, you know, what I want is to try to get this idea on as many lists as possible. Right. I sent it to a staffer. She read it and uh, and we had long talks. And I want to get this. Look, you know, look, everybody's got a wish list when it comes to legislation. Um, I just want to be in the conversation on this issue. I, I've already, as you've or, as you described, I've, I've made it clear how I feel about the FAIR Act, right? I really want us to pass the FAIR Act. I have all sorts of other things I'd like us to do. But, you know, if, we, if we're if we really worried about state uh, laws kind of going bye-bye, I think we need to do something at the federal level. Well, you know, um you mentioned the AMG case, a uh, Supreme Court opinion that basically made it clear the FTC couldn't obtain monetary relief for consumers. Uh, and I know the FTC wanted to get the law amended to overturn that Supreme Court opinion. Uh, that didn't go anywhere uh, for sure. But, you know, uh, this, if there was sort of a, a vehicle that um, you could use. This is a standalone bill I don't think would ever get through, but if it was part of a another bill that, that took care of other things dealing with the Federal Trade Commission Act, or maybe, who knows, Miriam, uh, after the Supreme Court concludes that the CFPB was unconstitutionally funded, uh, anything could be up for grabs. At that point, there will be a lot of horse trading going on uh, at that point because neither the Republicans nor the Democrats will have enough to get everything that they want. So maybe uh, you you get yourself a seat at the table, right? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think one of the things that scholars can do is do the heavy lift of the research to, to sort of, you know, bring the idea to the forefront. Um, and that's what I hope to do with this piece. Um, but you're right. The politics of the moment are, are so, um, sclerotic and paralyzed. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, uh, staying up at night, you know, hoping that this, uh, this idea goes through. But I, but I do think that there are some people uh, who are interested in this and who knows, right? I mean, I, I don't think I could have predicted the last um, 10 years. So who knows about the next? I, I've got one more question to ask you. 
Uh, and we've been talking all, most of the, t- uh, the time on our show about the Federal Trade Commission Act and amending that uh, to create a private right of action. Uh, but your paper doesn't address at all whether you considered amending the Consumer Financial Protection Act. That is the act that became law as part of the Dodd-Frank Act and that created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, and uh, that statute, as we all are painfully aware, uh, has a, a an analog to Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, except it's more draconian from the standpoint of industry. It proscribes unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts and practices. Um, why is it that uh, uh, you didn't consider um, putting it into that statute? It's a great question. And, you know, given the the, the pending, the looming Supreme Court decision, maybe I should have because the CFPB may be no more. And maybe if uh, there was a private right of action, that would that would remain um, e- even if the agency were struck down um, because of its funding stream. Uh, you know, I, I looked um, j- just to, so your your listeners know, Alan actually sort of posed this question to me earlier and I did some research um and uh, looked into now that I've now that I've mastered legislative history research, I did some legislative history research on the Dodd Frank Act. You know, much shorter uh, legislative history uh, there, right? As you remember, the Dodd Frank Act was enacted at a time when we were, you know, in the, the midst of you know economic collapse, and there was a lot of concern about making sure that there was somebody, an adult in the room, right, that this sort of thing would not happen again. Um, so it's a much more truncated legislative history, but I could find nothing, no debate over a private right of action. So that's fascinating. Maybe I'd have to drill a couple of levels deeper, and there are always levels deeper to drill in legislative history um, research, but I didn't find anything. And I, I wonder whether um, by the time we get to 2008, when the Dodd-Frank Act is start, starting to be debated, there's already enough consciousness about um, about plaintiffs, lawyers, and class actions that even progressives thought that might be a third rail, right? That that might defeat the bill. Um, you know, that certainly was not true in in the early part of the last century, right? When we didn't yet have a robust plaintiffs bar or, or certainly a class action rule upon which it would be built. So I think maybe there's an answer there. I'm I'm really not entirely certain why there wasn't a private right of action in the CFPB Act. You know, Alan's question is maybe wonder whether there's a, you know, a, a second paper. Academics are always thinking, is there another paper here somewhere about the CFPB? But I think we all have to wait and see what happens next term. Yeah, I, I mean, I would have thought that, I mean, at that point when uh, Dodd-Frank was enacted, the industry was very vulnerable because we had just, you know, gotten out of the recession. There was a lot of antipathy against the industry, a lot of antipathy with respect to the government regulators who people thought had dropped the ball. You know, I'm thinking of the banking regulators like the comptroller of the currency. And I, I, if that had been included in the bill, uh, my guess is it would have flown through uh, because Elizabeth Warren got about just about everything she wanted. She, you know, a single director and, of uh, uh, funding, uh, ins- insulation from congressional appropriations and UDAP with the abusive prong. So this just would have been one other thing. And, you know, people were feeling in a very uh, punitive kind of mood or maybe uh, we're seeking retribution uh, at that time against the uh, the banking industry. In any event, it wouldn't have mattered, right? Because um, soon after we get AT&T versus Concepcion, we get class action waivers and the consumers that we're talking about could never be able to bring these consumer class actions anyway. So I'm not saying Congress was prescient. They never are, but... I'm glad you mentioned that because actually that made me recall one of the things that you did talk about in your article, because otherwise uh, you, you would have a problem uh, you specifically put in language saying that uh, you can't waive the right to go to court, that consumers, uh, you can't be forced to go to arbitration. So 
you've dealt with that issue. Yeah, I think obviously any legislator has to think about that very carefully and in, in, in granting any positive rights to sue at, at any point, right? Because it, the waivability is such a huge issue. Yep, yep, got it. Okay, well, Miriam, um, is there anything that we've overlooked that you think our listeners uh, ought to be aware of? that's relevant to the topic we're talking about today, or have we pretty much covered the waterfront? I think we've covered the waterfront. I think this is a pretty thorough discussion. But of course, I, I'm happy to send anyone the article if they'd like to read it, or you can find it on the Arizona Law Review's website. And I guess you can get it on the um, social, what is it called? SSRN, the, yeah. SSRN, SSRN. Uh, that's where I got it. Um, and I became aware of it. I should give credit where credit is due. I think I found it on the Consumer Law and Policy blog. I think Jeff Sovern, Professor Sovern from St. John's, uh, had done a blurb about it, and uh, that gave me the idea uh, to contact you uh, to do a program. So again, thank you very much for taking the time today uh, to uh, enlighten all of us uh, about uh, this very important article, a little scary, uh, for those of us who are in the industry, but nevertheless, uh, a very important article. So thank you for you know being on our program today. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree. We'll have to do it again. So to make sure you don't miss our future episodes, please subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Don't forget to check out our blog. Also goes by the same name as our podcast show, Consumer Finance Monitor. And if you have any questions or suggestions for our show, please email us at podcast, that's singular, podcast at ballardspar.com. And stay tuned each Thursday for a new episode of our show. Thank you very much for listening today and have a good day.